So we'll go ahead and uh, start getting started. Welcome everyone. Um, thank you for joining us today as we start the, uh, the Lectures in Mathematics ed Education series. Uh, the Lectures in Mathematics Education series is sponsored by the Herman and Rossi Edge Mathematics Initiative and Rossi Edge School of Education with the goal of highlighting important research targeted at improving teacher effectiveness in mathematics education, including Dr. Cobb and Ms. Slayton here. Uh, we have a great group contributing to this lecture series and many of the lectures like this one will feature a co-presenter who can speak to the impact of and or their engagement in uh, the research that's being discussed from a school's or teacher-based perspective. Uh, we're thankful to be able to provide access to this series virtually and for our guest speakers and those of us and those joining us for being flexible enough to work in this newfound digital space. Uh, today I'm happy to introduce Dr. Cobb and Ms. Slayton who will begin the series by talking about uh, coaching as a key support for improving the quality of mathematics teaching at scale. Dr. Paul Cobb is a research professor in mathematics education at Vanderbilt University's Department of Teaching and Learning. His research interests focus on how to support the improvement of mathematics teaching and learning at scale. His work has been recognized numerous times, including his receiving the Hans Frudenthal Medal for Cumulative Research Program over the prior 10 years from the International Commission on Mathematics Instruction in 2005, and the Silver Scribner Award from the American Education Research Association in 2010 for the research over the past 10 years that contributes to our understanding of learning and instruction. In addition, he's an elected member of the National Academy of Education and is an invited fellow of the Center for Advanced Studies of the Behavioral Sciences. Finally, it's important to note that a book edited by Yackel, Gramiget, and Safard that describes the evolu evolution of his research program was published in 2010, titled A Journey in Mathematics Education Research, Insights from the Research of Paul Cobb. It provides a fantastic overview of Dr. Cobb's commitment to linking theory and practice and how his career's work shifted from investigating a single student's thinking to understanding district right improvement in mathematics education. He's joined by a collaborator, Jessica Slayton, who is the director of mathematics for Metropolitan Nashville Public Schools, a large urban school district that serves nearly 86,000 students in Nashville, Tennessee. Her work primarily entails designing and implementing instructional and curricular supports for the stakeholders of our district as they strive to improve the quality of math instruction and learning outcomes for students. This includes providing ongoing professional development for administrators, teachers, and instructional coaches, as well as assisting schools in setting improvement goals. As a former high school math teacher and instructional coach, she has a passion for pedagogies that highlight student thinking and the co-creation of knowledge through exploration and meaningful discourse. After Dr. Cobb and Ms. Slayton finish their talk today, We'll have a little bit of time for some questions and we ask that you kind of post those in the chat feature here and we'll collect those and we'll, uh, we'll bring those up there at the end. Uh, thank you for joining us and I'd like to turn it over to Dr. Cobb and Ms. Slayton. Thank you, welcome. Thank you, Michael, for that's quite an introduction. We'll try and begin to live up to it at least. So, and we have a voice activated system. So if we could have the next slide, please. What well, here's the sort of game plan in our 40 or 45 minutes. Uh, Jessica and I, I've had the privilege, it is a privilege to work with Jessica and her colleagues for the last four years. And we've established a research, genuine research practice partnership. And we want to give some background to that, the way we work together in the first part of the talk and the focus. And then we're gonna shift to the substance of the work, which focuses on supporting the development of a cadre of accomplished math coaches, particularly folks who can support teachers in improving their instruction as they work with them one-on-one -on -one in their classrooms. And then against that background, we're gonna, it's not exactly a shift, but it's an elaboration of the work with coaches by focusing on practical measures which we've been, of instruction, which we've been integrating into the coaching work and our claim is that coaches' use of these measures can enhance their effectiveness in supporting teachers' learning. All I want to say at this point, before people hit that leave button when they hear this is about measurement, it's not what you think. These are not accountability measures. They're very simple things. They're actually student surveys uh, designed to give folks feedback to help them improve what they're trying to get better at already. 
They're specifically designed to guide and inform construction improvement efforts. So if we move to the next slide. We thought it would be a good idea. This might be bringing, I'm from England, we'd say bringing coals to Newcastle. There's a lot of coal in Newcastle, you see. Uh, the, uh, what we take uh, the basic tenets of high quality math teaching simply because this form of practice would be the goal for teachers learning. The first thing is the teachers would organize a, a significant proportion of the lessons around challenging non-routine tasks. In other words, tasks where students have to analyze the task situation in order to figure out how to proceed. Uh, it would involve in other language, mathematizing the task situation, analyzing mathematical relationships in the task or whatever. And against that background, the teacher would launch or introduce the task. And we've come to see this as an under-researched but absolutely key aspect of high quality instruction that's also critical from the point of view of equity. Our colleague, Kara Jackson, has done the foundational work in this area and it's a pretty challenging to do well. On the one hand, the teacher needs to introduce the task so all, and it does mean all, students can begin to work productively on tasks. Not that they have to solve it correctly, but they have to actually engage with the mathematics. And yet in introducing it, the teacher maintains the level of challenge rather than, as we see all too often, the teacher proceduralizes the task in effect shows students the solution method in advance, which defeats the object of the exercise. Having introduced the task, kids work on it in small groups or perhaps individually. Maybe they're allowed or encouraged to talk to a neighbor if they want to about the math they're working on, followed by a whole class discussion. And I think a number of you know the stacks of research on characteristics of productive discussions, which would involve, for example, the teacher eliciting kids thinking, supporting kids to explain their reasoning in ways other kids can understand, uh, pressing kids to make connections between different solutions and so forth. Suffice to say, this form of teaching is a radical departure from current practice for many teachers, certainly in Nashville Metro, and I assume also in the Los Angeles area. Uh, it has been in every district where I've ever worked and it requires sustained support. So this is a shared vision uh, that organizes the work Jessica and I and our colleagues have been doing together and constitutes the goal for math learning. Now, against this background, if I go to the next slide, please. For, I've been interested in the issue of instructional improvement scale for the last 15 years. For the first 10 years of that, we worked partnered with four large urban districts. And again, it was genuine partnerships. And we were investigating what does it take to improve the quality of instruction across such a district? And what came out of that work was the identification of a coherent set of potentially productive improvement strategies. Why potentially productive? Because it depends on how well they're implemented. There's evidence these can move the boat forward if they're implemented well, which is easier said than done. But the, we talk about a system because it's, they span from the classroom to the district central office. And if we want to improve what goes on in classrooms, yes, district leadership really does matter. And we can trace down the influence of the classroom. School leadership is also critically important. But if we move to the next slide, one, issue is absolutely critical. And if we don't make progress on this issue, everything else is for naught. Yes, we can figure out what high quality leadership, instructional leadership looks like at the school or district level, if we're aiming at ambitious and equitable instruction, but it's establishing a system of high quality supports for teachers learning. And there's two aspects of this I want to unpack slightly. One is why a system? because there's increasing evidence, and I'm thinking of the work of people like Hilda Borko and Elhan Kazemi, that high quality PD by itself might well not be enough. It's important, 
It's a part of the system, but it's not the, the only thing. The second thing is, I mentioned we worked with four districts for those 10 years. What we found was, God bless them, they would have a number of different initiatives to improve math instruction. There would be district level professional development. They would have teacher collaborative groups, maybe meeting once a week, maybe twice a week in school time. And at some point or other, they all had content focused coaching. What we found when left to their own devices, each of those aspects was not coordinated with the other. So there might be one focus on what teachers were working on in teacher collaborative meetings that was unrelated to what had been the focus of deep district professional development and so forth. And it became very clear to us as we worked with district, it was absolutely critical to coordinate these various supports for teachers learning so that they had a common focus. They were working on a particular aspect of instruction. For example, how to launch tasks effectively. The second aspect is high quality supports. Yes, our districts certainly had teacher collaborative meetings. Yes, the teachers really were there. Yes, they really were focusing on instruction. But most of those meetings were not going to enable teachers to actually begin to develop ambitious and equitable practices. In other words, it depends not just on whether the form happens, teacher collaborative meetings or content focused coaching, but on the quality. And in our experience over the last 10 years, the field has made quite a lot of progress in identifying key aspects of high quality teacher collaborative meetings and also of content focused coaching. The challenge is how to support, for example, high quality content focused coaching across different school contexts reliably. So on the one hand, well, I, I back up. We often in education think of implementation as a pretty trivial uh, aspect of the enterprise. The main thing is coming up with the idea, and then we just leave it to folks to implement. I think increasingly over the last 10 years, a number of us are seeing this is really where the action is. It's figuring out issues of implementation across schools, across a variety of a range of districts where you can still have relatively high quality supports. And that's the sort of space in which Jessica and I have been working for the last four years. And so for us, the key pro a key problem, I don't want to say the key problem, is to support the de development of district capacity for instruction improvement. Onward. So thinking about that, a little context about the district. It is a fairly large urban district. We have 168 schools um, from, uh, we have some early learning centers, some elementary schools, middle schools, and high schools. Our student population is fairly diverse. Um, and we have about 18% who are English learners with about 140 languages spoken across our buildings. So even though um, that's not a, a terrifically high number of English language learners or a high percentage, uh, the diversity within that group um, is quite uh, significant. And Paul earlier described our common definition of high quality math instruction and in Metro Nashville, we have really distilled that into one simple statement that you see on the screen uh, with three main ideas. First, that students are reasoning and problem solving, that they are doing the heavy lifting, we like to say, uh, with the work of mathematics. Um, that they are communicating and, in a sense, co-constructing their knowledge with their peers. And then also that there is an aspect of valuing mathematics so that they are seeing both the beauty and the utility of math um, in a balance of concept and then also procedure and application. So they have all of those. And some history with our partnership. Uh, this is the beginning of our fourth year of really focusing on this partnership. And I think it's important to emphasize 
that we really do have a common vision. And that is something that I believe contributes to the, the impact that the work we've done has had and that um, it's been such a productive partnership because of that shared vision. And also to the idea that we negotiated what work we would be doing. Originally, uh, the intent was to work on teacher collaborative time. And um, in discussions, I shared that I really didn't feel like that was a lever that I had much influence on. And we didn't know that it would do much um, if that was the focus of our work. So we negotiated to work instead in supporting the development of coaches because that was something that I um, thought would be scalable because it was part of the work that I was charged with doing in the district. And in this partnership, we did actually have a full design study um, in 2018-19 where we uh, were recording data uh, from our sessions with the coaches. We had eight sessions throughout the course of the year. And so we were charging the coaches with implementing their learning in between the sessions. And we were able to gather data on their practice and how their practice evolved throughout the course of the year. Um, and thinking about how the sessions may have contributed to that learning and the development of their practice. So that work we did was really collaborative in nature, that we were um, determining a focus of the session, co-planning, co-leading, and then really analyzing how the session went and how it was received and what, what our coaches learned for the session so that we could make sure that we were meeting the needs of our coaches and also that we were pushing their practice uh, to a deeper level. And so thinking about the work that the coaches do to support teacher learning, um, first our goal is firmly rooted in students. Uh, it's so important to us that all students um, are engaging with mathematics in a meaningful way because they all deserve that and they are all capable of that. And that is the real heart of our work and what drives us. And in order for that to be the experience students have, we believe that ambitious and equitable pedagogies must be enacted by our teachers. And that's uh, what we were describing before. And as Paul mentioned, that is a significant shift for many teachers um, and many of the teachers in our district. And so thinking about how can we support the teachers in that work in an ongoing and sustained way. And so our coaches do that in a variety of ways. Some of them are group coaching activities, such as collaborative planning, professional development in their schools, and then also engaging in professional learning communities. But then the work that we have partnered in is really focusing on that last piece, the one-on-one -on -one coaching. And so while coaches receive training on all of those pieces, um, the one-on-one -on -one coaching is the part that our partnership has really focused on um, in the last few years. And our goal for the coaches is really that they are enacting coaching cycles on an ongoing basis with with teachers, um, thinking about really uh, going through full coaching cycles. Uh, we have found, and I think um, there's evidence in the literature that a lot of uh, coaching is just observing and debriefing, and that is not a particularly effective model when you're thinking about trying to improve instruction. And so our press with the coaches was to include uh, co-planning always as part of the cycle so that they're co-planning and then the lesson is enacted and there's a debrief. And uh, based on the work of Jen Russell and her colleagues out of the University of Pittsburgh, there is evidence that ongoing cycles of this type can make an impact, a positive impact on uh, teacher practice. And so that has been the work that uh, we've been pressing the coaches toward. 
but we did tweak the cycle a bit for our context in that um, the classroom enactment piece, uh, the blue at the bottom, uh, is not just the coach observing. Uh, we have given the opportunity for uh, coaches to make a principled decision about what they will do during that time. So perhaps they will model during the lesson enactment or co-teach or they can of course also observe but that is how we have modified that cycle just a little bit um, for our purposes also in this work i think and honestly uh influenced very heavily by the uh, systems for instructional improvement book um, that was mentioned at the beginning uh, we realized that it was really important to have the right people coaching in order for the work to make a difference and so in our district um, principals hire coaches and principals um, supervise and evaluate and determine if coaches will keep their jobs so we um, don't have an influence in that piece so the way that we um, tried to support the correct people being in the positions is we put a structure in place where we do a district level screening for potential coaches and uh, those candidates are put into a pool and then the principals can hire from that pool and we screen for four different things some of them are fairly common, such as strong content knowledge and understanding of the role of a coach. I think that um, is typically uh, a screener that or uh, criteria people might use. Uh, but we also do spend some time with the candidates to make sure that they have a well-developed vision of high quality math instruction. Uh, if they are going to support teachers to enact these ambitious and equitable practices, they need to understand what they are and they need to believe in them. And so that is a screening that, that we include. And the last piece is that the uh, potential coaches have productive views in the students' current math capabilities. Uh, the belief system that they hold in what students are capable or not capable of uh, uh, is a significant impact on the work that they can do. So we make sure um, that the coaches that are screened and then hired believe in the capabilities of teachers so that, or I'm sorry, of students so they can support that work um, in teachers. We also uh, tried to support our coaches in selecting the right teachers to start their one-on-one -on -one coaching cycles with, uh, particularly thinking about novice coaches or coaches who are new to a building. Uh, they may have difficulty trying to determine who to start their work with. And so we helped teachers, or I'm sorry, coaches um, gather information about teachers' current practice and also their belief systems. So helping the coaches then screen teachers for their vision of high quality math instruction which is actually really important for the work of a coach because if a teacher's practice, if they're not enacting these ambitious and equitable practices, you need to know as a coach, is it because they don't know them and they need to learn these practices or that they have the vision but they don't know how to enact them. And that's very different work that a coach would do. And so we try to help the coaches understand uh, where their teachers are as far as understanding the vision. We also help teachers, um, the coaches screen the teachers or gather information around their view of math capabilities of their students. Uh, we found that if the teachers don't believe in their students, then they, they are less likely to enact <laughs> the high quality teaching practices. So trying to help the coaches know that about their teachers so they can support them. Do they need to develop the views of student capabilities or do the teachers already have those views and they can build upon that. And then the last piece is a teacher advice network, which is 
information, honestly, just about who the teachers talk to and how often they talk to them when they're seeking advice about classroom practice. And I have an image of that. So this is an example of a teacher advice network. And we taught our coaches how to um, gather information for this and then how to map these advice networks. If you notice the key in the bottom, it shows how frequently the interactions are happening. And then also the arrows show directionality. So if you look between teacher A and teacher G on the left side, the arrow um, is on both sides to show that they are asking one another for advice. Uh, but some of the arrows you see are one direction. So teacher A is asking teacher B, the arrow goes from A to B. So this information, this is advice network is very helpful because it helps the teachers or the coaches recognize connections and collegiality that may exist in the building and also to make principal decisions about who they might work, work with. Because if they know that a teacher has sophisticated views about instruction, then it's great to know that other people talk to them because you know the advice they give is going to be sound advice. But if you know that a teacher doesn't have um, strong beliefs about students or doesn't fully understand high quality instruction and you know everyone talks to them, then it helps you decide uh, that you need to develop those things in the teacher um, so that the advice they give will be better advice um, when they when their colleagues reach out to them. And now back to me. I'm switching now to the sort of focus of the professional development work. I just want to say everything Jessica just mentioned, she did entirely on her own. Uh, I happen to be living in the same state at the same time. Uh, I guess they came out of conversations or something we had, but we view that as not specifically about PD, but though putting those sort of structures in place is absolutely critical uh, to instructional improvement. As Jessica said, we made a few tweaks to the standard model. The first one was teachers, coaches making principal decisions and whether model co-teach or observe and just give feedback. The second one was on coaches identifying goals for individual teachers learning. Where did this come from? Well, the very first time we worked together on the PD sequence, the wheels came off in session three. Here's what happened. We gave them, uh, the coaches, 15 of them, a little case study of one teacher's, an account of one teacher's lesson, just a two pager. And a very well-meaning teacher chose a pretty challenging task from our point of view, the launch was really problematic. We just described what happened in the launch in a non-judgmental way. We then recorded all the different ways the kids worked on the task. And from our point of view, it was pretty apparent that many of these kids really didn't know what the task was asking, and they were just doing something with the numbers uh, to try and satisfy the teacher. And then there was a sort of whole class discussion which went pretty poorly, the kids weren't very responsive and so on. And the question we asked the coaches is, what would you work on with this teacher? And what surprised us, it certainly surprised the heck out of me, all of the, none of the coaches saw this as a challenging question at all. They thought the answer was pretty obvious. You're gonna work on questioning in the discussion. From our point of view, that was somewhat problematic because there wasn't a range of student solutions to have a productive discussion. So even if you improved the quality of the questions, the kids would be no better off. That led us to begin to focus on goal setting. And I think this is a good example of the benefits of working in a research practice partnership. If we hadn't been involved in doing the work, we would never have had this learning opportunity. And so in the elaboration, not to be more to follow, uh, before a coach even begins working with a teacher, we suggest they visit that teacher's classroom, begin to establish a relationship, observe instruction, 
and collect evidence, for example, of students' work, of take notes on instruction, and against that background, begin to identify an initial improvement goal for that teacher. So in the case I just mentioned, that might focus more on the launch rather than the whole class discussion. And then they would negotiate an improvement goal with the teacher. It's a partnership between the coach and the teacher, just as it's a partnership between researchers and practitioners. If the teachers don't see the value of a goal, then it's, the improvement is not gonna happen. Ultimately, it's the teachers that have to do the improving. And as part of this work, if we move on to the next slide, we came up with two criteria for what we consider productive improvement goals for a particular teacher. First of all, it's a feasible next step for that teacher's learning. And secondly, it's likely to result in improved student learning if attained. If in the example I just gave, they had focused on the discussion and on questioning, the kids would be no better off. If instead they focused on trying to improve the quality of the launch, there's still a ways to go, but at least the kids could all engage substantially in the task now, rather than spending most part of the lesson figuring out something to do to keep the teacher happy. They weren't really doing mathematics at all. And we also figured out as we worked through this, or at least alluded ourselves in, that it was an insight, what are critical questions to ask yourself to identify goals? We would say two of them are, were all, and we do mean all the students, able to work meaningfully on the task? If the answer to that question is no, clearly something inequitable is happening in that classroom. And secondly, was the range of student strategies rich enough to have a productive discussion? And we kind of captured this in a little tool if we move on, Jessica. We call the root causes tool, one of the coaches named it this, and those questions are in this box up at the top in the center there. If the answer to both those questions are yes, all the kids work meaningfully in the task and there's a rich range of solutions, then maybe you want to focus on the discussion with the teacher. If the answer to either question is no, there are issues with the prior part of the lesson. It might be the launch, it might even be the task is just not a challenging task. And this is a tool we share with the coaches and based on the data we collected when we track the coaches in their practice, by and large, astonishingly, we're using it and almost invariably, they're at least landing on what we consider to be a productive aspect of the lesson to work on for that teacher. The astonishing thing is we've sort of dug through the literature, we cannot find anything specifically about coaches identifying goals. When they are mentioned, it's either you go with the district priority or you just ask a teacher and go with that. We certainly want to have teachers have voice in the process, but at the same time, we want to make sure that goals got productive onward. And I also mentioned negotiating. So that now I'm, we're focusing specifically on the debrief phase of the coaching cycle. And again, we have a little template for this. And um, we, obviously I'm just presenting it. We don't do it like this with the teacher, with the coaches. We work through cases and so on. And this is where we end up. But basically, first of all, let's remind, when we're having a debrief, remind ourselves, what was the learning goal for the kids today? mathematically. Secondly, what did the kids actually learn in that lesson? It might involve looking at student work or whatever. That's a huge change from typical coaching practice. Typically, coaches don't look at the kids' work. I can understand why, and I'm sure Jessica can. They're charged with improving instruction, so they immediately launch to instruction and totally bypass kids' learning. We want them to analyze what actually happened. Teaching should be at the service of instruction. And only then turn to instruction. And the question is, why did the kids learn what we found they learned? You're analyzing instruction in order to explain learning. And when you do that, or when coaches and teachers do that well, they naturally identify strengths in a lesson and also weaknesses. And those lessons, 
weaknesses but can become in the hands of a skilled coach future improvement goals which make sense and are reasonable to the teacher precisely because the justification is in terms of the kids learning. And so thinking about that and how important it is um, for these coaching cycles uh, to be enacted um, well, uh, one of the main uh, presses that we had with our coaches was really to help them understand that there's so much work that actually happens in between the time that you are with the teacher. So thinking about that on-ramp that you um, use before you even begin coaching um, and begin these cycles and negotiating that first goal into co-planning and then really thinking about what evidence should you gather during the enactment because you want to make sure that you are capturing um, what's necessary to have that conversation, that meaningful conversation with the teacher. So then the lesson is enacted and then really thinking about what specific evidence to share. A lot of information can be gathered in a full hour long lesson and that can be very overwhelming if you try to talk about all of it. So thinking about what are the key ideas um, that will help the teacher realize what would positively impact student learning and really focusing on that. And having that debrief uh, and negotiating that goal with the teacher and then really thinking about supporting that teacher in an ongoing manner because this is an iterative process. You're going to go through this cycle again and they may need some additional learning to be able to enact these um, pedagogies in a meaningful way. And so thinking about the idea that it's not just about improving that one lesson, but it's about improving their instruction overall and how to support them in an ongoing way to do that. Now I'm looking at the time Michael so we'll keep going till you tell us to shut up. It's 5.40 <laughs> my time, 3.40 your time. But beyond what we've talked about so far in around session five, so not at the beginning of the work with coaches at all, we introduce practical measures. What a practical measure is specifically designed to enable folks to improve their instruction. They're also called measures for improvement. Some that um, also, we've used to call them small measures. They've got to take three minutes or less to collect the data. Why? They've got to fit in with practitioners' current practices. These are not assessment events. They are to, at the service of improving practice. The data has got to be easy to analyze, simple counting. And the data should enable folks to determine whether and in changes and improvement, whether a change a teacher and a coach are making instructionally actually is an improvement or not. Or was it just a mere change? And if we move on, Jessica and I are part of a larger group that's developed a set of practical measures of aspects of instruction, exactly those aspects listed on the, sec the second slide. The rigor of the task, which is a very quick rubric. The other three measures are little short student surveys. Uh, one around the launch to assess the, student, the quality of the launch, one around small group discussions, and one around whole class discussions. The, I just want to mention, as time is short, I just say the big boss of this effort is the Kara Jackson at the University of Washington. Others involved are in your neck of the woods. They include Tom Smith and Marsha Ng at UC Riverside, and June uh, on uh, UC uh, Irvine is developing the data dashboards. We already, the coaches are already using a teacher dashboard with teachers so they can look at their data very quickly and if we click on to the next slide Jessica folks think because they're very quick to administer they have to be short that they're very easy to develop sadly not true I'm going to skip this as time is short other than to say we go through that development cycle and it on average it's five cycles so 
In other words, the constraint that they have to be very short and quick actually makes it harder rather than easier to develop because they darn well better be valid if teachers and other folks are making decisions about kids' instruction on them. And if we move on, here's just a simple example. Part the first stage of the process of development is obviously reviewing the relevant literature, a lot on whole class discussion as our example. So for example, one key aspect of high quality whole class discussions is how it depends crucially on the range of solutions, which depends on launching. So we have an item, did you, what did you need to do to be successful in your math class? And there's a couple of response options there. And they what is it, solving problems using the steps the teacher showed me, listening to and making sense of other students' reasoning. And again, we've been through so many cycles before we go to these final items. And another one is around the classroom culture. Were you comfortable sharing your thinking in whole class discussion today? Yes or no? Clearly, a lot of these items are also relevant from the point of view of equity. And then pressing and supporting students to, to explain their reasoning. Item, did you have trouble understanding other students thinking in the whole class discussion today? Clearly, if, they, if some students do, we've got problems and it's inequitable as well. So if we move right along, uh, go ahead. We see the measures being utilized in two different phases of the coaching cycle uh, because they are administered during the, at the conclusion of the lesson. And so they're used during that portion. And then also the coach and the teacher analyze and discuss that data as part of the debrief. And so they're utilized in that session as well. And Can I, I just leap in, Jessica? Yeah. I Sorry. apologize to you. No. The only other thing I want to add is remember, anytime they go into a coaching cycle, there's an improvement goal for the teacher. So they would, the coach would then use the survey that's appropriate to that goal. If they're working the launch, you use the launch survey. And you even see if there's particular items that line up with the goal. Mm -hmm. And then you can check, are we moving the meter on those items? So one specific example from one of our coaches um, and working with a teacher, they said, um, or they were sitting in a debrief conversation and they looked at this. Did you have trouble understanding other students thinking in today's whole class discussion? And they were really uh, troubled uh, with the number of students who said yes. Um, and thinking because the teacher, this was so important to her. And in their discussion, uh, the coach said, well, I noticed when a student will share, you would rephrase what they were sharing. I wonder if, and they had this great relationship. So the teacher sort of finished the sentence for her, having another student rephrase. And so they were able to identify a focus for their work and thinking about if she made that small shift in her instructional practice, would it make a difference for students? So they began working on that and then they re-administered the survey in another coaching cycle about a month later. And you can see there was a a significant shift in uh, the number of students. So um, more students were able to understand the thinking of their peers. And the teacher said, that's great, put it on my resume, uh, which I'm sure she meant as a joke, but, but it is a way that you can then look to see if the change you made is actually an improvement for your students and is that um, worth pursuing and was that a, a worthwhile goal. Um, so I, I think it's helpful in that way in that it's focusing your attention on something you might not have noticed otherwise. Um, even if a coach and a teacher were to analyze student work together, uh, that's limited in what it reveals. Uh, if a student misses a question or can't solve a problem, you don't see why. 
But when you think about these aspects of instruction, uh, about whether or not you understand the explanations or what you think the purpose of class is, or if you feel comfortable discussing, that can really um, give more insight into the student experience uh, through their perspective of the lesson. And I'm gonna, be, I'm gonna skip most of this as time is short, but just to say beyond orienting teachers and coaches to focus on aspects of instruction with no matter for student learning. We've also been exploring if uh, the use of practical measures enables coaches to be uh, more effective over and beyond determining whether a change is an improvement. And if we click on, and I'll keep going, let's stay there. Uh, very good doctoral student just finished and now is on the faculty at University of North Carolina, Greensburg, and he did a very nice dissertation investigating that issue. And he found that if coaches use practical measures with teachers, it can, I'm going to clarify why I want to say can, but not does, support them in developing more powerful explanations of how instruction influences student learning and it can support them in identifying productive improvement goals. But like all tools, this isn't just a silver bullet. It depends on the skill of the person using the tool. And in particular, what turned out to be critical was whether the coach presses the teacher to relate student survey responses to instruction. So imagine that example, uh, Jessica just gave where they, uh, the teacher said, yeah, put it on my resume. Suppose they then look at kids' responses to all the other items. And suppose they look at, were you comfortable sharing your thinking? And suppose 50% of the kids said no. They might just look at that and say, hmm, that's, wonder, that's a problem. What was critical was whether the coach asks a question such as, why do you think most of the students chose that response? Or why do you think most of the students said they weren't comfortable? And then steers it to focus and start analyzing instruction. That simple move, which is in our estimation, gonna be very teachable to coaches, makes the world of difference. In making that move, the coach is supporting the teacher again to connect content learning goals, students reasoning and instruction. Many of you will recognize as the three aspects of the pedagogical triangle that Deborah Ball, David Cohen and others have talked about. Don't wanna to take too much time, but I wanna emphasize that relationship comes up all over the place when we identify what high quality coaching looks like. My colleague at Van, uh, uh, Vanderbilt worked with us in a pro the prior project focusing on teacher collaborative time, she found that that was an absolutely key characteristic of high quality teacher collaborative meetings. It's also a character, key characteristic of high quality professional development. For us, it's becoming almost a key principle of high quality supports for teachers learning. So thinking about where our work is going, uh, we are working right now to uh, make it possible for us to implement these practical measures in the context of online instruction because we are currently uh, teaching that way in Nashville. And then also thinking about developing some additional measures and working toward that um, on the quality of one-on-one -on -one coaching uh, and then also teacher collaborative meetings. Yep, and that's, those measures are quite a long way along. And Jessica and her colleagues have been involved in the development of those measures just as they were the classroom measures. And beyond that, we also want to conduct some research analyses that can feed back to inform the professional development. Thus far, our analyses have helped us clarify what high quality coaching looks like. But remember, we did this in the context of PD. So we're now going back to those data we collected the year before last to 
analyze the coach's learning or lack thereof and how it was supported with an idea of how could we refine and improve what we did and come up with a pretty solid design. And Jessica before mentioned VSMC, which stands for Views of Students' Math Capabilities. If and when we can get back to coaches working with teachers in person, we would really like to investigate the issue of how coaches specifically can identify and then support teachers who currently have unproductive uh, views of their kids' math, math capabilities. Our best conjecture right now, and what we recommend to coaches, is that they model instruction, but not so coaches, so teachers can get a vision of a particular aspect of instruction, but they focus on their, what their students are doing mathematically when a coach who's a pretty accomplished teacher supports them in by launching a task effectively and so on and our bet is that the co the teacher will be shocked at what the kids are capable of thank you the end <laughs> do you want me to put that slide with the oh yeah yeah the... yeah yeah I just mentioned particularly the second one the practical measures are available and you can download them from that second website uh you if you're interested in the, the launch and all the rest of it uh, thank you for reminding me jessica <laughs> and now do you want to pull up some questions michael well, thank you <laughs> dr Kong and uh Ms. slayton for that wonderful talk uh if anybody has any questions feel free to share them in the chat and we will uh get to a couple here for for a few minutes before we conclude. So one question is, what are some of the enabling conditions that say state leaders might put in place to help facilitate the kinds of coaching and interactions you talked about? I can start, that's certainly beyond what I typically think about. I normally don't think of beyond the district. But it would seem to me that, I don't know if it's a policy thing, but uh, if there is a way to support district leaders in understanding the relationship between more rigorous state standards and assessments in mathematics and the implications for what needs to happen in the classroom. That would be very helpful indeed. We've, we often characterize school and district leaders as sort of, they don't understand their barriers. In my experience, these people are doing the best they can with what they've got. And most of them really care a lot about the kids. Uh, but they've never had limited opportunities uh, to uh, come to appreciate that relationship. And now I know, Jessica, you certainly work with principals in Nashville to kind of help them understand what has to happen if they want their kids to do pretty well on state assessments. Uh, yes, um, but considering this uh, question, I think uh, it would be nice if the assessments measured what we actually said was high quality uh, learning. Right? So deep learning. Unfortunately, sometimes the assessments uh, focus so much on speed and so that causes a misunderstanding um, for teachers and school leaders. And they um, begin focusing on aspects that are not as important. So if the assessments could, um, could show the value in different ways of thinking and different ways of expressing uh, your understanding, I think that would be really helpful in trying to support the work that we are trying to do um, in, in our district. There has been initiatives in Tennessee around funding some, funding some coaching positions. If not, that could be helpful as well. Yes, um, I, not in my district. We haven't had any funded by the by the state, but th that could be beneficial as well. 
so we have another question from Nancy who asked uh, kind of how quickly did you see improvement in coaching skills with the screened coach participants? I would say, I'm thinking the data we were collecting across the year and pretty quickly. Uh, now, not from zero to 100, but we had a major aspect of coaching to f just one aspect, but a big one in each session. And we certainly saw improvement, for example, dramatic improvement in how coaches were identifying goals and in debrief meetings. But we also had a large number in the debrief of what we called miss opportunity cases. It was, they just didn't ask that one question. Why did the kids steering to not just look at how the kids responded, but to explain it in terms of instruction? We think if we were to tighten up what we did, we would see dramatic improvement pretty quickly in the quality of debrief conversations as well. It was quite striking, for example, how although it was a surprise to them that it would be a good idea to focus on student learning in debriefs, it seemed to make sense to them and seem reasonable pretty much everybody almost immediately. So I think we, you can make some pretty significant progress with a relatively limited amount of PD. I don't know if Jessica would agree or not. No, I do agree. I, I was wondering around that question, was, was it coach the screening process uh, specifically? I thought it was, maybe I misunderstood. It's if you've screened co coaches, so you've got the right people in the pool, do you see improvement? Is that the question or did I answer the wrong question? Yeah, I think that's the question that was asked. So to some degree, we were still working with a group of people who weren't pre-screened um, because they were already in established positions. And so we implemented this so that the new coaches coming in um, would have um, the qualities that I discussed. So I think that um, actually was really helpful because it helped us shift what we talked about uh, in meetings uh, or professional learning. We didn't have to start from scratch and try to develop a vision of high quality instruction with the coaches. Um, so unfortunately, we did have to do that before with some of the coaches, but the new coaches coming in um, now have that baseline of understanding. And so we, we haven't had to backtrack um, to the same degree that I felt like we did before. Yeah, let me just add that we feel very strongly it's about those criteria that Jessica put in for screening. It's so much more than just being an accomplished teacher who's got good content knowledge. That's really important, but that gets you in the game. If you've then got to support somebody's development as a teacher before you support them as a coach, it's just too big a lift. Mm -hmm. it's a, there's so much to learn to be an accomplished coach. And we try to point to what some of those learnings are, that it has to be somebody who's already a, a relatively accomplished teacher with productive views of what kids are capable of to make it feasible. All right. Well, thank you for your time today, everyone. Um, we really appreciate your time today, Dr. Cobb. And oh, no, a pleasure. Thank yes, you for thank joining you. us. Um, just a little information real quick. Uh, you will be able to find this talk. We have a YouTube channel that will post this. If, you're, if you think you missed something and you want to go back, we will have this available online in the future. Um, and in addition, we also have another talk coming up just in a couple weeks on the September 30th uh, with Beth Herbal Eisman and a couple of her pre-service teachers will be joining her as well. Um, thank you everybody for joining us and thank you again to Dr. Cobb and Ms. Slayton. And yeah, right. <laughs> it was wonderful. Thank you so oh. much. Yeah. I wish we could oh. all fly. <laughs> 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 They're all standing, I swear. Yeah, exactly. That's right. Flowers. Bye-bye. All right. Thank you, everyone.